I finished my Colorado Trail through hike a couple of weeks ago. And so since I got off the trail, obviously I've been thinking a lot about that journey, processing the journey. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is the advice that I would give to future Colorado Trail through hikers. What would I have wanted to know ahead of going out on the trail that I could share with others who are gonna be coming behind me? So to, in today's video, that's what I wanna talk about. I wanna share 10 tips for future Colorado Trail through hikers, things I wish I would have known before I started the CT. So let's go through that list of 10 things. First and foremost, I would say if you are coming from out of state, from a lower elevation area, do not get too overwhelmed by the elevation when you are starting off. One good thing about starting the trail in Denver versus Durango is that if you start the trail in Denver, you are gradually building up to higher elevation. If you're starting in Durango, you're getting yourself up to high elevation pretty darn quickly. And when I say high elevation, I mean like not too far from Durango, you're gonna find yourself at 10, 11, 12,000 feet. Whereas in De if you start in Denver, it starts a lot more slowly and you build up more gradually. I would say in terms of elevation, if you're coming from out of state, give yourself a day or two in Colorado to adjust to the elevation before you jump into your through hike. And I would also say, don't get too overwhelmed by it. Like if you're feeling it a lot at first, your body should adjust fairly quickly. So to give a pretty good example, I live in Boulder, which I believe is about 5,500 feet above sea level. Today, two weeks after having hiked the CT, I am right now up at 11,000 feet. I'm at a place called Heart Lake, by the way, which is about, the trailhead for this is about an hour from Boulder. Here's a full view of the lake, since I know some of you like to see where it is that I film my videos. But anyway, so I'm up at 11,000 feet. And so during my hike today, I was really feeling the elevation because that's, I mean, that's like a 5,500 feet elevation gain during this hike, right? Up from Boulder. I mean, I did not have to hike up <laughs> that much. The elevation increase wasn't that much. But since my body's used to being at 5,500 feet, I'm really feeling it at 11,000 feet today. But I guarantee you, if I camped overnight here by tomorrow, I would be feeling this a lot, lot less. And while I was on the CT, I was frequently above 12,000 feet and it didn't really bother me because you kind of get up high on the CT and you stay up high on the CT. So the elevation really isn't bad once you adjust to it, which will take a little time, but once you adjust, you will notice it a lot less. Tip number two is to bring sun protection. Obviously on any backpacking trip, you're probably gonna want sun protection, but there are a lot of places on the Colorado Trail that are pretty darn exposed and you have to go through like dead forests, for example, where the trees are gone because they've burnt or because they've been taken down by invasive beetles. And the sun's rays are a bit stronger at high elevation, so you might be more likely to burn. So I would definitely recommend bringing sunscreen, a sun hat, a sun shirt. And if you are very sensitive to the sun, you might also consider bringing a sun umbrella. My friend Ibex had one on the CT. She used it in all the exposed sections of the CT. She absolutely loved it and it made a big difference for her. Tip number three, if you are starting at Waterton Canyon, which is the starting point if you're starting the trail in Denver. And this section is pretty exposed. It's lower elevation. It's like 5,000 feet. This section can be pretty sunny and pretty darn hot for a lot of the summer. So I would recommend not starting in the heat of the day. Start early in the morning, start in the evening, try to avoid the middle of the day where it's gonna be super, super hot because it is pretty darn exposed. I started my hike at 5.30 p.m. and my first hour or so was pretty darn warm so just recommend maybe not starting at like noon tip number four section two is also really really exposed and really hot you are hiking through a forest that was burned down for about 10 ish miles and there's no water during that 10 miles the section would actually be longer without water except that there is a fire station about 10 miles into that section that has a spigot on the side of the building and they invite recreationists to come and use that spigot to fill up their water bottles. So thank you, firefighters, you are amazing. 
But anyway, so that's a good stopping point in order to get water along the way during section two. But seriously, that section is, is so hot. Ivex and I actually got up at 4 a.m. So we didn't have to hike through this section during the heat of the day. And we had a really, really pleasant hike for our first several miles. And we found that by 9 a.m., it really started heating up. So we were really grateful that we got through a lot of that 10 mile stretch before the heat really came in. And I would recommend you do the same, same thing, either start early in the morning or start later in the day, not when the sun is gonna be beating down on you. Tip number five is that afternoon thunderstorms are really common in Colorado in the summer. And you do not want to be above tree line when the afternoon thunderstorms come in. And that's because if you're above tree line, there's a much better chance that if lightning strikes, you could be the tallest thing around and you could be the thing that the lightning goes for and you could get struck by lightning, which I know that you can get struck by lightning anywhere. This could obviously happen anywhere at any time, but the danger goes much higher when you are above tree line. So people actually do get killed by getting struck by lightning in Colorado every summer. So it's just something to be aware of. Generally, we'll get afternoon thunderstorms that come in and they stick around for an hour or two and then they go away. So you always have the option to stop below tree line if there's a storm coming in, set up your tent, wait it out for a couple of hours and then continue on, which my friends and I did a few times during our CT through hike. Tip number six is another one that involves section or segment two. So segment two and three, as well as the section between Silverton and Durango are really popular sections for mountain bikers. And I found that doing those sections on the weekends, there were tons of mountain bikers. I'm talking like I had to move over off the trail every five minutes to let a mountain biker go by. And I understand that they have every right to be out there. They have as much right to be out there as the hikers do, but it is really frustrating when you're trying to make miles and you have to move over every five minutes. So I would really recommend if you can avoid doing segments two and three in the section between Silverton and Durango, if you can avoid doing it on a weekend. I think that would do a lot for your, for your, for your happiness during those sections. Tip number seven. When you get to the Breckenridge area, it's maybe a place that you're gonna wanna stop, get a hotel, get a shower, resupply your food, etc. So you can stop and stay in Breckenridge or Frisco. Both are great options. And there are a lot of free buses in this area. There is a bus that will take you from Breckenridge to Frisco and then Frisco up to Copper Mountain, where if you are into slack packing, which means leaving your heavy gear behind, you can actually slack pack a 15 mile section between Breckenridge and Copper. I did this, I really enjoyed it. I would recommend it if you are not opposed to slack packing. The bus is totally free. You can just ride up, go up to Copper, leave all your heavy stuff in your hotel room, and then slack pack that section from Copper back to Breckenridge. And this is a really, really beautiful section but it's also a pretty tough climb. And it's one of the earliest tough climbs on the trail if you're starting in Denver. So I think it's a, a good place to kind of build up your trail legs and do a tough section, but not kill yourself by bringing all your heavy gear. And I personally really had a great time doing this because since I, I rode the bus up to Copper, I hiked back to Breckenridge, I was going northbound for that section, whereas for the rest of the trail, I was going southbound. So I actually got to pass several hikers that I, that I had already met along the trail and say hi to them because they were still going southbound. I was going northbound, so we crisscrossed, which was, it was really fun to see them again. Tip number eight. I loved all of the trail towns that I stopped in, all of them. Colorado has some just incredible mountain towns, but if I were to suggest you stop in one town, in one town only, I would say stop in Lake City. <sighs> I absolutely love Lake City. Lake City is super, super hiker friendly. There is a local Presbyterian church that has really put a huge effort into rallying the community around having hikers come in. And so they really wanna be known as a hiker town. So the church actually has a hiker center where you can go and charge your devices and hang out and get snacks and use their fancy espresso machine and do some art. 
They have Wi-Fi, it's all free, and they really welcome hikers in. They have a shuttle almost every day of the week from the trailhead closest to Lake City that will pick up hikers at noon and bring them into Lake City. On Sunday nights in the summer, they have a hiker dinner that's hosted by the community and the church. And the people of the town will make all this food for hikers and welcome you in. Clap for them as they come in. And it's totally free of charge and, oh my gosh, delicious and just amazing. If you've hiked the Appalachian Trail, for example, you know how amazing some of those trail communities are along the trail and how much they help hikers and how much they do trail magic and that sort of thing. And this going to Lake City was really reminiscent of that. In addition, Lake City is really walker friendly. It's super easy to walk around the town. It's a really small town. There's a river running through it. It's super cute. And they have everything there that you could possibly need. A grocery store, a bakery, which I went to three times, a laundromat, a post office, a really great breakfast place called the Hangout in Euphoria. And it's just a really, really nice vibe there. And several people that I had talked to in the town asked me why I had come to Lake City. And I said, because of its reputation among hikers, everyone who comes here loves it. And they were like, that's what we want to hear. So anyway, highly, highly recommend that you stop in Lake City. And I would also give a shout out to Salida because I also really loved Salida. And I'd kind of like to live there at some point. Tip number nine, when you go through the Collegiate Peaks Wilderness, this is past Twin Lakes, you will have to decide if you want to do the Collegiate East Route or the Collegiate West Route. The Collegiate East Route is the more traditional route. The Collegiate West Route is the CDT Continental Divide Route. The East is lower elevation. It's more forested. It's more of a quote unquote classic wilderness area. You can stop at Princeton Hot Springs. Along the way, it's less busy. The Collegiate West is higher, ele higher elevation. It's more dramatic and beautiful. I've actually done both routes. I did the Collegiate West while I was hiking the CT, but I also did the Collegiate East last summer. So I have pretty good perspective on both. So I would say if you're looking for an easier, more road remote wilderness experience, maybe go with the East. If you are looking for more dramatic landscapes, beautiful views, like an epic experience, go with the West. And if you're not sure which one you wanna do, maybe check the weather. The weather looks great. Go for the west because you're going to have some freaking epic views. If the weather doesn't look so great, maybe go to the east because, again, you don't really want to be above tree line when it's thunderstorming or storming in general. And a lot of the collegiate west is above tree line. So, hope that helps you make your decision there. And finally, tip number 10. In the section between Salida and Creed, you are spending a lot of time walking through cow pasture and there are cows everywhere doing their business in every single water source. I saw comments on Far Out that were like, oh, don't worry about the cows. Like they're not getting in the water, blah, blah, blah. Yes, they are. I saw them. I literally saw them in so many water sources. And I saw signs of them among other water sources. They're everywhere. <laughs> so if you have a sensitive stomach, as I do, you might want to consider bringing some purification tablets into this area in addition to your filter. So I filtered all my water. I also purified all my water in that section. Once I got past Lake City, we weren't really seeing cows anymore. So I stopped purifying my water and I went back to just filtering it. But I personally know that I have a really sensitive stomach. I've heard that people in this section get E. coli and upset stomachs every single year. I didn't want to be one of those people. <laughs> so it's up to you, but it might be something that you want to think about. So there you have it. There are my 10 tips for hiking the Colorado Trail. I hope that you found some value in those. You found them to be helpful. If you have hiked the Colorado Trail in the past, I would love to hear what tips you have to share with future hikers. So please drop those in the comments. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber to my channel for more hiking, backpacking, and outdoor content. And stay tuned, I'm gonna be doing a logistics video very soon. So if you're looking to hike the Colorado Trail in the future and you're not quite sure how to handle the logistics logistics of planning your trip. I am going to do a video on that very soon, so stay tuned for that. All right, you guys, as always, thank you so much for being here, and I'll talk to you all later.